Welcome to Writer to Writer, my author interview series. I'm Diane Callahan, and I'm here with author Mindy McGinnis. She's published seven novels to date, including Not a Drop to Drink, The Female of the Species, and The Madness So Discreet, which won the Edgar Award. She also hosts a writing podcast and blog called Writer Writer Pants on Fire. So tell me a little bit about what the road to publishing your work has been like for you. Well, it's definitely been rough, that's for sure. I started writing when I was in college, and I wrote four novels before my fifth one was finally picked up by an agent and published, which was not a drop to drink. It's post-apocalyptic survival. And I was trying for about 10 years to get an agent. Now, that was on and off. It wasn't constant querying, but maybe two, three-month breaks in between bouts of (laughs) <laughs> feeling so dejected I couldn't continue anymore. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's something that I like to tell people, aspiring writers often, is that I was querying for 10 years. And among my published writer friends, the average is about seven years. And while that might be kind of a bummer of news, I think it's also kind of positive because it lets people know, you know, you don't have to be an overnight success. You can wait, you can plod along and that's fine. That doesn't mean it's not going to happen for you. It just means that time is moving in that manner for you and it's going to be a slower crawl. And honestly, when I look back at the work that I was querying at the beginning, I needed to write for mediocre, well, maybe two mediocre and two really bad novels before I wrote one that was worthy of representation. You just released your second book in a fantasy duet, Given to the Earth, which is the sequel to Given to the Sea. Uh, So what was your elevator pitch for that series? That's a great question. The elevator pitch for Sea, I use now when I'm talking to people, when I'm table selling, or if I'm just uh, throwing something out there really quick, I call it Game of Thrones with less raping and no dragons. But (laughs) that's kind of the... Yeah, that's kind of the best pitch. It's very complicated. It's got a complicated plot and complicated world building. So it's actually very hard to summarize fantasy quickly. Another way to put it, because it's set on an island where there are four different uh, cultures living and they all discover right around the same time that the seas are rising and they're never going to stop. And basically whoever has land will survive. And so if you take the children's game king of the mountain and the floor is lava and you combine those that would also be a decent way to pitch that book so there are four points of view in there and they're from the four different cultures that's correct yes do you face any challenges writing that many points of view so it became more of a challenge than with the second one as far as differentiating because there is a brother and sister pair that each have their own POV in the second one. And they're from the same culture. So making sure that everyone has unique and individual voices. I've been very lucky in that my reviews, especially I believe my review from Kirkus and one from School Library Journal said, you know, there are six points of view and they all shine. And that made me feel really good when you had you know, a professional review that said, yes, she can handle six points of view. That was a compliment that really made me smile. And what was the word count on your fantasy books? I think the first one was just a shave under 100,000, like 98. And then the second one might have been 99. Like it was close. We were, I originally was over 100,000 and and then we, we trimmed down just enough. But they're big books. They're long books, both of them. This is your first fantasy series, right? It is. That's something that really interests me about your work, how you've written books across various genres. You have your fantasy there, you've written dark contemporary YA, a gothic historical thriller, and of course your post-apocalyptic survival stories. Uh, So do you have any writing tips for crossing genres or switching genres? I think when you're crossing genres that it can be very difficult to watch what you're reading while you're writing. So when I'm drafting a book, I make sure that I am not reading in the same genre that I'm writing in, because that can be difficult to keep your voice distinct from the voice of the fiction that you're reading. Sometimes that author's voice might sneak in. So that's something that I am very conscious of. But I think if you are immersed enough in the genre that you want to be representing that you will be able to present it honestly 
for A Madness So Discreet, which is the gothic historical thriller, it's set in 1890. So before I started writing that book, I read novels that were from that time period, like eight or nine, back to back to back, just to absorb sentence structure and the way people spoke and vocabulary, all those kinds of elements that are really going to create an immersive historical experience. And then while I was writing that book, I don't believe, because I wrote that book very quickly, I wrote it in like three weeks. So I don't believe I read it all while I was writing that book. I was just trying to maintain that status quo of that voice and that immersive world while I was writing it. When it comes to beyond the craft of actually jumping genres and selling across multiple genres, I think YA is kind of forgiving in that you are able to be more than one thing when you're writing YA. But I haven't had a major hit yet. I haven't hit New York Times. I haven't had a huge bestseller. And sometimes if you are a writer that really blows the doors off the barn with something amazing, they want you to keep replicating that. They want you to keep giving your audience that thing. So in some ways, it's a good thing to be a mid-lister because you are free to experiment a little bit more and wander into genres that otherwise you might be limited with in your success, which is a weird thing to say, but success can limit you. Are there any genres you haven't written in yet that you'd like to try? I would like to write an adult literary. I would like to write an adult literary um, with multiple, with dual timelines, one in the past and one in the future. This is something I'm looking forward to working on over this summer. I don't know if it'll ever see the light of day, but it's something I want to try. I can probably commit to never writing a romance. That's just not going to happen. Writing a fantasy was really a goal for me. It was something I always wanted to do. It was the most challenging thing I've ever written. And so being able to execute those was for me a major, major goal. I want to talk about one of your contemporary young adult novels, which felt more in the literary spectrum to me. And that's The Female of the Species. I read it a few months ago. I absolutely loved it. It just has an engaging writing style, very interesting characters and those three first-person narrators. So how would you describe that one? Do you have a one-sentence logline that you use? I called it Dexter if Dexter would, were a teenage girl that only killed rapists. <laughs> or um, I think I just referred to it as rape, revenge, vigilante justice. I know that my editor pitched it in-house as the girl with the dragon tattoo goes to high school. <laughs> So um, I've been fortunate in that when you are already working with an editor and they're asking to see what you have next, that you're able to put two or three pages in front of them. You're able to write a synopsis or an outline or pitch an idea, but have more room. You don't have to do that quick elevator pitch and grab attention, but that does come later when you're trying to sell. Uh, personally, when you're trying to pitch at a book festival or in interviews, people want those those quick, easy digestibles. Do you usually have to compare your book to something else as part of the sales aspect of it? Sometimes, usually there's comp titles like that. That's, um, that's pretty typical. I don't worry about it too much because if you're already published, you have an editor working with you. And so he's the one or she is the one trying to build up in-house enthusiasm for it. And usually comp titles are the way to go. And that can be really fun. It's like taking things that you really love and you're not taking characters or voice, even plot. Sometimes you're just taking the feel of it. So when I'll pitch A Madness So Discreet, I'll say that it is American Horror Story season two meets Sherlock. And deeply, it has nothing to do with those things. But that captures the feel. Insane asylums, detection, and murder, you know? So it's like you can find TV shows or movies or books that are easy mashups that are a really quick way to convey what you're trying to create with something new and different. Earlier, you mentioned that you'd written several books before selling your first one. 
Uh, when I spoke with you at the Ohioana Book Festival last year, you mentioned that you wrote the first draft of this female of the species as a teenager, and then years later you just scrapped the whole thing and started with that kernel of an idea and rewrote it. So how do you even tackle that level of revision? I think I would have been about 20, maybe, when I started writing The Female of the Species, because I was in college. I think I was a sophomore. It's possible I was 19. Um, but that level of revision, honestly, once you've realized that the words that you're grappling with, that you generated in the beginning of the process, aren't doing their job, you just scrap them. You just get rid of everything. It wasn't revision so much as it was complete and total starting from the beginning. I file a new document. The only thing I brought over from that old manuscript was the title and two of the characters' names. Like, that is it. And that is actually a much better approach when you're working with a manuscript that you wrote when you were not as good of a writer as you are now. If you're trying to revise with already existing words, you're just kind of tinkering. And it's going to be very hard to reshape that into something that reflects the writer you are now. So when you're working with a very old manuscript and you have improved, hopefully, from where you were when you wrote that. In my case, it was 15 years. So a long time had passed. And I advise just taking that core general seed of that idea and just starting over because you're never going to be able to inject what you need into those old words because they're kind of dead. They don't have, at least mine didn't have what they needed in order to become what the female of the species is. It sounds like since the time had passed, you didn't have that emotional attachment to it anymore. So it was very easy to be like, nope, that's gone now. Oh, there was no emotional attachment. I was looking at what I had written and like, wow, that sucks. And it did. I mean, we're talking really bad. So no, there was zero emotional attachment. I, I was reading it and, and making fun of myself. It was so bad. I would love to read a passage from The Female of the Species so that everyone can get a taste of your style. Uh, this excerpt is from the perspective of the main character, Alex, and she's questioning why she has these violent feelings all the time. Still, the question remains, what is wrong with you? Because something is, and I know that. I tried to find out, looked up the words and the phrases that seemed as if they should fit, words like sociopath and psychopath, ones that people like to toss around without knowing what they actually mean. But neither of them fits. You spoke of lack of empathy, disregarding the safety of others, when I am the opposite. I feel too much. I think this quote relates to what you say in the acknowledgments. All my books have taken me to dark places, but this one had special corners where the shadows were quite deep. So what are you trying to explore with these darker types of stories? So for example, with that particular quote that you just read, for me it was really important to show that while uh, Alex has obvious problems, she is not particularly diagnosable as someone who doesn't connect with other human beings. So people often misinterpret what a psychopath is. A psychopath has their own emotions and feelings. They have a hard time believing that other people have those emotions and feelings. So that's why it is easy for them to hurt others because nothing they see coming from others seems genuine to them. So whether it be pain or emotion, begging, whatever the case may be, they're not going to react to that because they don't believe what's coming from the other person is real or legitimate. So to me, if you have someone like that committing crimes, there's no struggle there. They don't feel any, they don't feel any remorse. They don't feel bad about it. So for Alex to be kind of a warrior for others, because she's defending other people when she does the things she does, if she doesn't have any kind of struggle with what she's doing, there's no real story there. It's just someone doing the right thing for the right reasons in their own mind. So I needed her to be able to realize that there's a gray area she's operating in. She might be doing bad things to bad people, but is that okay? And so she needs to see the people that she is harming as human beings and say, I'm going to shoulder that guilt 
And I'm going to operate with that and still keep doing what I'm doing. So for me, that is an actual struggle and actual character. So it's important to have that distinction for me. This isn't someone, this is a normal person. This is not someone that has any type of diagnosable mental illness. This is someone that has decided in order to protect others, she's going to take on the mantle of guilt and responsibility. So that's why that particular passage was important to me. Um, as far as exploring darker themes, it's funny because people ask me that a lot because all of my books tend to be particularly dark. And people ask me, how is it, is it difficult to write these things? Is it hard? And the answer is no. <laughs> this is how my mind works. This is what I think about. These, this is the place my mind goes. I would never be able to write a happy book. So for me, it's the same as asking someone, well, how can you stand to write such happy things all the time? Like for me, that's actually a struggle. I would never be able to do that. I think it's interesting the way that you write violence, though. It doesn't feel like shock value to me when I read your books. How do you achieve that where you write violence in a way that's honest and interesting rather than existing only for shock value? I think of it like writing like a horror film. You know, there's a difference between like a slasher flick and something that makes the audience actually cringe because it's honest. So when you see someone being murdered, I think if there's a scene in the Zodiac movie that um, David Fincher directed when the Zodiac killer is stabbing someone and it's so casual and it's so quick and it doesn't, there's not blood. You don't see anything. You just see the body and then it's just one, two, three, four, five, stab, stab, stab. And he walks away. And it's so casual that it sticks with you. And when you can write violence like that, it's not there for shock value. It's like, this is what this would look like. That's what I always operate with. Not what's shocking, what's going to make people be like, oh my God, I can't believe that happened. I want people to be like, oh my God, that's what an actual stabbing would look like. And walk away from that disturbed. <laughs> so do you have any more dark projects coming down the pipeline? I do. I have a book coming in March of 2019 titled Heroin. Heroin with an E on the end. And it is about the opioid epidemic. It's about a young female athlete who has an injury and her team needs her in order to hit the levels that they're supposed to attain in their uh, senior year season. And so she ends up relying on opioids to get through her recovery. And then the slow slide down into heroin and addiction begins for her. So that comes out in March of 19. And then I have a book coming out in the winter of 2020 that's called Be Not Far From Me. And it's about a girl who's lost in the Smoky Mountains and she's out there for a very long period of time all alone. And that was particularly difficult to write because when you have one character with no one to talk to, <laughs> everything is internal. Is it really common to be expected to pop out a book every year like that? Generally speaking, yes. You want to have a book out a year now I do also, that's a, I mean, that's a choice. I also, this is what I do for a living. I don't work uh, outside of writing. And so I have to have a book a year or else I won't survive. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, typically if you want to keep your momentum, but there's nothing wrong. People take breaks all the time. Justina Ireland, she wrote two books, Vengeance Bound and The Promise of Shadows. And that was 2013 and 2014. And then she didn't have another book come out until just last month. And that was Dread Nation, which hit the New York Times. So she took a big break and, you know, came out swinging with a New York Times bestselling book. So, you know, it's up to you. It's up to what you're generating and how you want to operate within your career. Do you usually have to meet deadlines for specific sections of the book or you have some kind of weekly or daily routine that keeps you writing? No, generally you just, you're given a due date in the future and that is to turn in your full complete first draft. When I'm drafting, I tend to write a thousand words a day, which is about five pages. Uh, if I can hit 1500, great. 
but generally it's a thousand or five thousand for the week. So if it is Friday and I only have thirty five hundred words, then I'm not taking the weekend off, and I got to write fifteen hundred before we recycle on Monday. So yeah, when I am drafting, I make daily goals and weekly goals for myself, and you hit them no matter what. So if it's Sunday night and I haven't written a word, I got to write five thousand words. Do you have any tricks that you use to keep yourself going if you start losing interest in the project? Not really. When you write for a living, the trick to keep yourself going is I have to pay my bills. So I have to sit my ass down and write. Like there's no, there's no uh, choices involved. Like I will delay, I will find other things to do. But in the end, because procrastination exists in all of us, because we're scared, we're scared, we're not gonna be able to do it this time. And it happens to me too. Uh, but it doesn't matter. Like I have, I have a due date. If I don't hit the due date, I'm not going to get paid. Like I, I have to have the money in order to pay my bills and pay for my house and have food to eat. So that's all the motivation I need. Do you have any advice you would give your younger self looking back on all these books that you've published? Probably don't um, think you're so awesome. Because <laughs> I was so convinced that I was so great and that nobody understood my genius and the world was missing out on you know, true talent. And oh my God, well, I was writing crap. Like I was producing junk. So, but it's interesting because, and I've talked about this before in my podcast with other writers, in order to be a writer, you really do have to have this balance of ego and extreme humility because you can't be working on something believing that it sucks. That just, you will never finish. You will never write it if you believe it sucks. So you have to have that, oh yeah, this is awesome. Like you have to believe that. But you also have to be able to realize that it might suck. So that when someone gives you feedback, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, I see that, okay. So it's, it's an interesting balancing act. Mindy's books can be found on Amazon or at your local bookstore. I highly recommend The Female of the Species. Whatever you do, keep writing. <laughs>